Yeah, we can. Excellent. All right. Who has a bid or a solicitation or proposal, something that's due at five today, or who's in a major rush? I'm not. Can you hear uh, me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have a bid or solicitation proposal to work on or a question? I have a few quick questions. Okay. Um, you want to click on the link? Okay. Um, they said the contractors shall, what was it? The contractors shall provide a copy of the Maryland Department of Agriculture, Technical and Fertilizer Application Certificate for the personnel who may be serving in the contract. Do you need to have that information? When you turn the bid or after? Usually they require it if you win it. I don't, I don't have it now, but I, I was thinking about uh, subcontracting it. Yeah, uh, so if you find a subcontractor that has it, you're good. But what, what do I put in the, in the, in the bid? Do I right now with a subcontract that points now or how do i say it i don't think you have to submit it with the bid they don't normally require this kind of stuff with the proposal itself oh <laughs> they usually don't require it until after it's awarded okay um all right and then <clears throat> we go to the other the other um link that i sent you I, I do apologize. I know I have a snipping tool. Let me go to page 87. Oh, right there, right there. Um, yeah, what is that? Like, what is that? I'm not sure what they're asking. It's a fence area, quantity 12, bulletin board 8, drinking fountain. I'm not sure what, what they're referring to. And I tried to look in the scope of work and I couldn't find it. Looks like they're saying these are the number of uh, bulletin boards and beach areas, drinking fountains that are on the property that you have to mow around. And why would they meet me asking for a price? Oh, mo oh it's some mow around it? I guess. I'd have to read the whole um, uh, statement of work. I wonder if it's to calculate like a square footage maybe or something. Right, right. Track from an overall like, if, if, like that's how you it to a hey, gate, attendance site. Um, Dump station. No. Yeah, can't believe Yeah, I'd have to review the statement of work to see if I knew exactly what it was. But if I had to guess, <laughs> they're telling you those are the obstacles that you have to mow around. I know it's something. Okay. It'd be a good question if you can't figure it out in the statement of work. It'd be a good question to ask the purchasing agent. Okay. Alrighty. Looks like it's a five year contract. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody else got a question, bid, solicitation, proposal? Um, I just sent you that because it was an RFI. Okay. And um I wanted to find out if there was any specific <clears throat> in order to respond to the RFI portion. Because I can definitely deliver on that contract. You have the solicitation number? It's, uh, what do you, oh, I think they haven't put it out yet. They're just literally, I didn't know they would put it out. 
out. Yeah, yeah the RFI number. Uh, I'll look for it. You can move on, and I'll look. Okay. When well, was this something you found in FBO, or was this an email that was sent to you directly? No, they sent it to me directly. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't know if RFIs had their own number. I thought it was like, hey, this is a survey, you know, just, I don't know if I like respond back and be like, yes, I can do it or what, you know? Yeah, um, RFIs, a lot of times the sources saw it, request for information, they're put in, um, well, give me a second, I got a lot of background noise. All right, an RFI or a source of sought are often uh, posted in FBO, and they're, um, you know, purchasing agents may not know uh, enough about what it is they're buying. So they're going to ask for a professional opinion, a request for information, or a source of sought to find people that can give them information and maybe educate them on what it is that they're buying. So I get a lot of people that say, is it worth taking the time to submit an RFI? Yeah, usually because all they ask when they, there is an RFI is they want you to submit either a one page or a five page description of blah, 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 or they just want you to submit their cap statement, letting them know that you're interested. Uh, there's usually not a whole lot of work involved in an RFI as far as responding to it. And a lot of times that RFI will turn into, or that source of thought will turn into an opportunity eventually. And you've already built rapport with that purchasing agent because you're the one that uh, responded to them and, and educated them. Okay, so somewhere in all of that, or in FBO, there's going to be directions on the way that they expect a response. So I don't yeah. like just respond and be like, heck yeah, I got this or anything, right? Correct, okay. yeah. They usually say if you are an interested vendor or uh, specific response instructions, here it is right here. Please submit your RFA response in accordance to the following. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> No more than seven pages, seven pages, including the name, email, address, phone number, and the company. The government will not review information or attachments that exceeds the seven-page limit. Submit your response via email. Mark your response with proprietary information if the information is considered business sensitive. Marketing materials are not allowed as part of the RFI. Uh, they want to know your socioeconomic status, your size standard, point of contact information. Um, I want you to put that next code on there, indicate whether your company is a small business, one of minority hubs on 8A, et cetera. There's your scope of work. That's the title of the project. That's the background, delivery schedule. Uh, responding to this RFI, please, following questions. They want to answer these questions as well. And that's it. Short, sweet, to the point. So when it's asking um how like you plan to do the work and everything like so since I'm 100% just you know it, it's me and my company and then so I'm going it's a, like joint venture like you know so if I'm indicating that it's going to be some type of joint venture or something like that right I I would need to disclose like what if they're like a veteran owned business but they're not like certified or whatever but do I tell them that part or no if you're going to subcontract um if you're going to do it, joint ventures are, are a risky program because you have to go into a legal agreement with another entity. And unless you have an attorney involved to look over the documentation, you know, you, you could be getting, uh, you could be biting off more than you want to chew. I suggest instead of doing a joint venture, you sub out. You hire the guys, you sub them out, so you're in control. And, uh, you know, go, go that route instead of a joint venture or a teaming agreement. But if you are going to go joint venture or teaming agreement, uh, make sure you have an attorney review the documents before you, before you sign them. Okay. I just wanted to, is there like a, I guess, a list of the actual very specific definitions of how they view each of those different, um, I guess, whatever that word is? Not really. I mean, every purchasing okay. agent has their own idea of, of how the rules and laws work and, and what stuff's called. And so it's like some of them call the reps and certs, reps and certs. Some of them still call it ORCA. Some of them call it representation certification. Some call it FAR and DFAR provisions. Some of them call it federal acquisition regulations. It's all the same document, but they got eight different names for it, depending on how the purchasing agent, uh, you know, determines or, or views the, the way the government works.
Okay. And since the um, uh, the VA itself was actually, you know, deficient in some of their um, allocations for women on small business, like in fiscal year, like 2016, I mean, do you think that that increases my odds? Of, of them being like, hey, you're a woman, yeah, get on this? Sure, yeah, I mean, any any set-asides that you carry increase your odds, because even if it's not set-aside for a woman or minority or a veteran, if it's just set-aside for a small business, and they hire you as a woman or minority or veteran, they can still write that off, they can still claim it. Okay, but they're going to be well aware that they missed their mark last year for women, right? So I don't have to, like, be like, hey, you know, do anything special. They're going to know I'm a woman, and it'll... Oh, yeah, yeah, them. They're they're well aware, trust me. That's that's why that one contract. Some of you guys have I've showed you. Actually, I got it right here. I can almost guarantee you. That's why this happened. You know, this isn't a standard practice to give a, a billion dollar contract to a million dollar company. That wouldn't have happened five years ago. It's too risky. They would never have given a contract that's bigger than the annual revenues last year. But these days, they're throwing contracts at people that are just mind-boggling. And it's probably because he was a service-disabled veteran, small business, and they weren't close to hitting their criteria. So they said, hey, let's give this guy one for a billion, and then we're done. Wow. You know? Nice. Any other questions? Anybody else got a question? Oh, I got everybody muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Hey, John. Oh, oh, um, two hello. Questions. Ladies first. Hi, John. Yes. Uh, am I the lady or is that someone previous? You're the lady. <laughs> okay, John. <laughs> How are lady. you? Um, excellent news. My mouth was actually, uh, my chin was on my chest uh, for a second there when I saw that billion dollar contract. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm building on a little small contract. I, I, I hesitate to share the numbers, but what I want to know is how would I write myself in if I'm the prime contractor and I've got a subcontractor who's doing all of the work, how do I write myself in as a, um, uh, um, let's see, what, what would I call it? The manager of the project, the project manager. You're going to write your, so you're going to be the prime contractor and you're going uh -huh. to sub out to them as the subcontractor. Now, unless they specify in the instructions to offer that you need to disclose who your subs are, you don't have to tell them anything. Okay. But if they specify okay. in the instructions to offer that they want you to list who your subs are and their DUNS number and their cage code, most likely that contract's going to be over 650000 in which case they're going to require you to sub out 23% of it. It's not, they're not asking you to, it's okay. mandatory. Gotcha. You have to sub it gotcha. out. Okay, so, so the question really then is, is how do I, do I go into the options and, and add um, my portion? Because uh, it's, an, it's an extremely small contract. But nonetheless, I do want to, um, because I'm, you know, I'm sponsoring it. I do want to be paid for my time. Sure. So how sure. do I go about doing that? I'm not sure what you mean. It's a contract that you're bidding on? Okay, so, yes, I'm bidding on a contract, and, and primarily it's in square footage. It's uh, to seal a, um, to do some seal coating for a okay. um, parking lot. And so I'm not sure how to well, when you say win it, for the manager. When yeah. you win it and you invoice it, you're the one in charge. You're going to hire whoever to do it, and you're going to invoice the government to get paid, and the government's going to pay you, and then you're responsible for paying your subs. Gotcha. Okay. So I don't necessarily have to give them what they bid on. I'm trying to come in as the lowest bidder uh -huh. and at the same time um, allow for some extra. Sure. Yeah, you got to make some money. Just don't do this for the fun of it. Absolutely. So, it's so not, you're not saying that fun. <laughs> So, so John, I'm still kind of I'm, I'm quite new at this, so huh? I'm still not understanding fully. So, if in fact I'm bidding at, um, let's see, the range, the average range is anywhere from 14 to 24 cents per square foot, mm -hmm. and the subcontractor says they're charging 21 cents. What do I do with that? If I'm trying to come in as the lowest bidder and at the same time add on for the margin of profit. I'd shop around and find a couple more subs because if that's the range and they're at the high end of the range, they're not giving you any room to make money. There's no wiggle room. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, if you're gonna right. you're gonna sub it out, I would have at least three or four different subs that can do the work that give you a quote. That way, if one guy falls through, you got three more guys to fall back on. Okay, appreciate that. No problem. Any other questions? No, John. Uh, real quick. Um, so obviously, I got the part that you don't need to disclose a subcontractor unless um, it states. So my next question is, in regards to you going out of your category of NIC, NAIC, um, to go for a contract that is not in your NAIC, does that require you to plug that number into SAM, the number you're going for into SAM, or? No. You understand what I'm? I know no. exactly what okay. you're saying. Um, here's the thing. You don't have to have an NAICS code or NAICS code, however you want to pronounce it, NIACS, it's pronounced all kinds of different ways. You don't have to have that code listed in your SAM or in your FBO to bid on or be awarded or do any government work. Uh, if anyone ever has a purchasing agent that tells you different, don't argue with them. Tell them you'll add it. Email me. Send me the contact information to the purchasing agent, and I'll tell them they're wrong because they are. And here's why. Okay. As link, this article is on my LinkedIn. You can pull it up there if you want. Just email me and I'll send you the copy. I wrote this article specifically because uh, one of my clients won a contract and one of his competitors did a, a bid protest. They sent a, a bid protest to the GAO saying my client shouldn't have won the contract because they didn't have that NAX code listed in their SAM or their FBO. This is the actual bid protest letter from the Government Accountability Office, straight up. This is the actual letter with the decision, and the decision was denied. You do not have to have a NAX code listed in your SAM or your FBO to bid on a contract. Because uh, if you did, every time a purchasing agent uses the wrong code, you would have to add it, and eventually you'd have a bunch of wrong codes with a bunch of right codes, and then you had a big mess. that makes sense yes that makes sense um now in regards to you still going out for something totally different out of your NAC code do you, you have to change your uh, capability letter me yes and no um it's same theory you don't know but if a purchasing agent you know it, you, you can create cap statements that are templates that you can use for future purposes down the road. Changing your, your primary NAX code on your cap statement takes two seconds. And then save it. Not, not for that. I'm just talking about the, the, the statement itself, you know. Yeah, to some extent. I mean, the more specific I, I, the cap great. statement is to the opportunity, uh, the more opt they are to hire you. So, yeah, you could modify your cap statement for specific types of, of business. And then save it, and you've created multiple gap statements you can use in the future for those different arenas. Okay. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Any other questions? Anybody else got a question? Hello, John. Yes, I had a couple of questions. This is Janine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question. We were looking at a, a bid, and we're, we were working on it. Um, we were not able to get the bonding because of the uh, difference in uh, geographic area. It was basically across the country. It was the perfect job for us right. as far as everything else. But it was, you know, it was in California, and we're lo located in New England. Um, so anyway, we were not able to acquire the the bid bonds that we would have needed. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of questions. First of all, what is the story about a pro bono office? Uh, is that something that we should have considered or maybe not for this? We're just beginning really. So we're looking at smaller jobs. So probably not for this job, but is that something and how does that work? Do you what do you do about your SAM address and all of that if you're using a pro bono office? Well, in many cases, you don't have to have an office in the service area unless the contract's what's called a brick and mortar. Brick and mortar uh -huh. means you have to have a physical location in the service area or you can't bid on it. Okay. 
And if it's brick and mortar, a lot of times um, you can you can only sub out a certain percentage of it. They want you to do a percentage of it in house. Okay. If it's not but brick and mortar, though. Not... Yeah, if it's not brick and right. mortar, uh, in most cases you can do it from anywhere. You can operate, you know, manage it from your location and hire a subcontractor that's local to do it. Right, right. Well, that's what what our intention was, but uh, the bonding company didn't look favorably upon that because of the dis, dis you know, distance and. Yeah. We were all set. We were, you know, we I were booked all for set another bonding to company. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's there's okay. thousands of bonding companies out there. Um, when I was a kid, I owned a janitorial. Uh, owned. I started a janitorial company because the restaurant that I bust tables at said, "Hey, if you clean our restaurant at night, we'll give you eight hundred bucks a week." And I was a kid, and I was like, eight hundred a week? Hell yeah. yeah!" And then I wound up picking up the two other, three other shells restaurants. So I basically started a janitorial service by accident. And in order to pick up the other <laughs> restaurants, I had to get bonding, but I was 17 years old. No one yeah. would bond a 17 year old, but I yeah, right, finally right. talked to a guy that he said, yeah, I can bond you, man. It's no big deal. Just don't steal, you know, don't, yeah. don't validate the bond and you're fine. Yeah. I got a million yeah. dollars bond for $232. Mm. You know, so it is that so the, it, it, going by that scenario, we should be able to get bonded prior to or get a bonding capability prior to actually being awarded a job or getting a job? Yeah, most, con I mean, most, most contracts don't require you to have the bonding up front. They allow you to get it after the contract's been awarded. But that yeah, could be an issue you if had you can't get big, it. Unless it's a you bid had bond. The bid, bid bond. Yeah, bid bonds are required up front. You have to submit your bid bond with your bid. Yeah. Anybody who's confused about bonds, anybody who's yeah. confused about bonds, let me know. I've got a, I got a um, signature with bonding information on it. What the difference between the bonds are, and a whole list of bonding agencies. Okay. Yeah. So anybody that wants that, just send okay. me an email and ask me to send you the bid bond email or the, the bond email and I'll send it to you. Okay, good. I have another question. That yes. that that uh, bid actually it went out one more and last Friday morning and then was uh, was accepted by Friday night. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. The the award was for less than the lowest, so it was a two fifty to five hundred thousand. Right. And the, the the so the bid came in at under the two fifty. Okay. Um, and they would would accept. They would take only the lowest bid. But we were, you know, we were trying to keep it as close to two fifty as possible, thinking that it would have to be between that range and and but but they accepted a company that was below that range is right is that is that is that is, is that uh i mean should we have considered that I, 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 not that this would have worked for us anyway but it's just the learning curve here for me yeah. Yeah. um so so is that legitimate and is that something that we should take into consideration if we can go below and still make some money that we could consider that? I would, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, figuring out profit margins and all that, I'd take my cost, figure out my absolute cost, uh, maybe add 5% on top of that as a cushion in case whatever happens, and then add your 15 to 20, 25% on top of that and and just submit it i mean you're going to find situations where the awardee was half of what they guesstimated you're going to find situations where the awardee was three times as much as the amount they anticipated i if you could imagine it i've seen it uh, i worked with a gentleman just a month ago uh one put in a bid and the purchasing agent came back and asked him if he wanted to redact it and he said no and she's like are you sure because i don't think you understood this the scope of work you're you're one mm -hmm. third of what everybody else is bidding. You know, everybody mm -hmm. else was at a hundred thousand. He's at forty, and and mm -hmm. the purchasing agent said, "There's got to be something wrong here. You must have missed something. So you need to go back through this and and redo it and make sure you're you're uh, on the money. Make sure you're you know you got the right numbers." 
And, uh, yeah, yeah. and he did, and he went back and he rechecked it. He had me check it. He had his attorney check it and he came back again. He said, no, I can do this at 20,000 and still make money on it and, and get some past performance and earn your trust. I want to do it. So she awarded it to him and he did the job. It only took him a week to do the job. He made like nine grand on it. Mm. You know, the other guys mm. were just over quoting it, whether they were, uh, you know, there's, there's some groups out there of people that will bid in a group fashion and they all bid high, you know, and like mm. kind of take turns, uh, winning contracts that way. And then they make huge profits, mm. but you don't want to gouge mm. the government. I mean, if the government figures it out and, and knows that you're gouging them. They can come down on you with a, with a hammer. Um, yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking of it the other way. I thought that we would have to be within the parameters of the bid. No, and no, so, you don't have to anything. You know, Not nothing's nothing's set in stone all the time. Yeah, you I thought what they I mean? would look at that as you know, this is like not like not have in in that in that situation of the scenario you mentioned, like not take it. As, this procurement officer took it a step further and said, "Look, it, are you really are you really sure this is correct?" I would have thought that they'd have looked at that and said, "Nah, that's." That's way off. I've seen it. You know, I've seen them do that. I've seen them. That's what I'm saying. Nothing's ever set in stone all the time. Because I've seen where a purchasing agent said, yeah. we didn't hire you because your price was too low. We assumed you would, didn't understand the solicitation or you were going to cut corners and do a bad job. And I've seen it where yeah, they, well, I've seen it where they've hired yeah. the highest bidder. Most small business set asides, it'll say in the instructions to offer <laughs> that the technical yeah. proposal is the most day. important factor. <laughs> that it's not like the, the price is last on small business set aside. So you'll see frequently when it's not about price, it's about solution. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's your president. That's yeah. the crime. This okay. one was about price, but uh, they had said they would, you know, we're going to take the lowest price. Is what it was. Lowest yeah, price, right. technically acceptable is usually, but if it's a small business set aside, yeah. it's usually about the solution, not about the price. I've yeah. seen where the government told people that they wouldn't hire them unless they charged more. I've seen the government, one of my clients, they, she invoiced them for 42000 and they said, no, we owe you sixty two, And she said, no, you only owe me forty two, And they were like, no, we owe you sixty two. That's how much you need to invoice it or we're not going to pay you. So they forced her to take more money. She called me, I'm freaking out. What should I do? I'm like, I mean, do what they tell you to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. That seems like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know why they would do it that way. But Thank you in your well, favor. You know, I don't know. I've but, seen stranger things. I've yeah. seen the government pay one guy $100 and, and buy the same thing from another guy for $1,000 at a yeah, higher yeah, quantity, yeah. Uh, which you would think would make yeah. sense. if the, the bigger the quantity, the lower the price. But I've seen one agency buy 10 of them at 100 bucks a piece and buy 1,000 of them at 800 bucks a piece. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it's, it's all in the eyes of the beer holder. It's what the purchasing yeah. agent perceives to be fact. And that's fact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Never, okay. never yeah. ever cheat, never ever lie. Yeah. But if, you know, if the government yeah. tells you to do something and you explain to them that it's wrong and they insist, I mean, you got to get paid. Yeah. You know, you got to, uh, right, right. Don't, exactly. don't overcharge them. Exactly. 15, 20, 25 percent markups. Plenty to, to make money on it. As long as you got your costs yeah. covered and a little extra to cover any any hiccups, and as long as you've gotten three yeah. or four quotes from different suppliers, you got suppliers to fall back on in case one falls through. You shouldn't run into any issues. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. You know, right. technically well, speaking, you. that movie War Dogs. The only reason why they got in trouble is because they didn't pay the guy who to you know, modified the, the packaging. Had they paid him instead of getting greedy, he wouldn't have never turned them in and they probably wouldn't have never gotten caught. Again, I'm not saying cheat or lie to the government uh -huh. ever, but I'm saying if, if yeah. you, you know, if you follow the rules and do, do, do the right thing every day, you never have to worry about your yeah. money. Yeah. Right, 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 right. That's right. All right. Okay. I'll, all right. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank no you. Problem. I appreciate it. No problem. Anybody else got a bid solicitation proposal or question? And I wanted to know if um, 
with all of this stuff coming down from you know FEMA and everything, is there a, a way that you know of that to monitor like the state and local contracts as well, like that are all kind of interconnected? Because I know a lot of this is trickling up or down or whichever it goes, right? Unfortunately, right now, the only thing you can do is register with the state. Each state has their own database. Each county, each city, each local municipality has their own database uh, for procurement. And unfortunately, you have to register in each one and monitor each one. Uh, a lot of them, you can set up searches that are automatic. So at least you don't have to go out and look every day. You can just check your email. Eventually, our AFPDS will track subnet. And eventually they're going to have it start tracking state certifications, which is going to take years to get that in place and make it work properly. So it's not a simple short term solution, um, but that's the goal eventually is to have AFPDS track everything. OK, awesome. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had a suggestion or maybe this is something I can help you with offline. Um, you know how you have like all of these like resources and all that. I could help you set up like a, a Google Drive um to where we can categorize everything and that way you're not having to email people but like if you know you're doing a training or whatever you can just like share like your folders with people like right. you know and then all the resources in there um if you'd like me to help you with that yeah it's something to consider we've talked about it before but then they're they're worried about putting everything in one place where our competitors can just go in and download everything and be done with it in one quick swoop you oh, you'd have to just, you'd have to still give the people access, yeah. <laughs> but they would just say, for example, you know, someone was wanting um, information on, like you said, the bondsman, you know, and so then it would just be like, you know, you send them um, a link or, you know, yeah. uh, that way you kind of, but whatever, it's just yeah. my notice. No, I know what you mean. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Any other questions? Anyone else got a bid solicitation proposal to work on? Okay, if, if no one has any other questions, I do have a couple. Uh, in regard to the um, um, looking into the mentor protege program, do you know anything about that um, as far as how that works, as far as working with another company? We, we are obviously we're in the protege end of it. Hello? Yes, I'm here. Are you here? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I didn't know if you knew anything about that, that you could give me any pointers on that or I do. I do. Information. I've heard more not so positive stories than I have heard positive stories. Um, okay. and, and, and here's the thing. Mentor Protege program is it's free. So how much time is someone going to invest for free in to making you be successful when all they get out of it is the uh accomplishment of helping someone i mean yeah there's good people out there that'll help you i'm not saying that at all but i'm saying how much right. does the average guy gonna give to someone uh that's not paying them you know um i can well, give you i can give you a prime example i had a gentleman call me about six months ago and he said john wayne thank god i found your videos he said i almost didn't I found one of your videos one day that had your daughter's picture on it and I wasn't going to click on it because I didn't think it was contracts related. I thought it was a recipe. <laughs> um, he said, I almost didn't click on it, but something told me to click on it and I did and I found you and I'm so glad I did because I've spent the last three years going in circles between the mentor protege program, between the SBA and the PTAC and the SCORE program he was working with for three years. And this is not my quote. This is, this is one of my clients that told me, he says, for three years, I've been wasting my time going in circles with these guys. And for the most part, all I ever get out of them is, is general answers. They don't ever give a specific answer. Uh, I don't know if they're not allowed to, but he says, they just kind of beat around the bush. I learned more from watching one of your one hour videos, I learned more in one hour watching your video than I have in the three years that I've spent driving back and forth almost daily to the PTAC or to the SBA or to meet my mentor protege uh, or to the FedEx to do this or that. 
I literally learn more from one of your videos in an hour than I have in three years dealing with all this government bureaucracy. Thank you, John Wayne. And that was one of the, you know, that was one of the worst stories I've heard. I've heard people say that their mentor protege program was pretty good, or they lucked out and got a, you know, a really kind, caring person that was willing to help and, and bend over backwards. Yeah. Well, I thought that it might work to have. So if you if you were working with a mentor program that was a small business but didn't have the um, service disabled or the women's or whatever the set aside is, didn't have that capability, then it could couldn't it be a win win? That's what I thought you were could be to, could it, be but kind of design for most mentor protege programs are not going to allow people in that are not already in the A A and successful. In which case they're probably not a small business anymore. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Any other questions? Anybody else got a question? Bid solicitation proposal. Good recipe for a buttermilk pie. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, all right, guys. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, I'll shut her down for today. I'll be back on here tomorrow, same bad time, same bad channel, every day, one and four. I'm here for you guys. Uh, you know, I want you to okay. be successful. So bring your questions, bring your proposals, solicitations, procedures. I'll do my best to answer your questions. If I don't know the answer, I don't always do. I'll find it. Well, thank, thank you so you, much. John. You got it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. No problem. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Talk to you tomorrow, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night.